Good morning. Come on now, good morning. I know the markets are bad, but they ain't that bad. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to be the keynote speaker and to see if my voice can carry over the noise you're going to hear over my back probably in the next half hour. But uh, I appreciate the honor of going first. A long time ago, there was a wonderful newsletter writer uh, named Kennedy Gamage, and he had many great sayings, and one of his sayings was, those of us who live by looking at the crystal ball over time learn to eat a lot of broken glass. So uh, I would tell you, at least for myself, I would not come in expecting the gospel from Peter Granich. Uh, at best, I will make a good educated guess, and at worst, I'll be detrimental to your financial and mental well-being. And probably be somewhere in between. The grace of God is with us. Uh, as the lady in the sky said, uh, I have a couple of businesses. One, Granite Publications, where I'm a paid consultant to mostly junior resource companies, and I publish a blog while I do that. The second business that I have back in New Jersey uh, is a Christian-based uh, insurance and estate planning business, which deals mostly with professional athletes. The rest of my time I spend in Christian sports ministry and in a terrible, horrible hobby, which is expensive, called harness racing. Uh, trying to see if my trainer is in here. Did you make it in here? I don't see you down here. Okay, you didn't make it. Uh, they say in a keynote speech, you're not only supposed to be able to speak louder than the airplane, but uh, you uh, need to set the tone. Well, I don't know if this will set the tone, but this first video I'm about to show you, in my opinion, says it all. But before I show it, how many people read the blog? So I have an idea. Okay, so many of you might have seen it, uh, but please pay attention to it again. In my opinion, in less than five minutes, uh, this person who made this video says everything you're going to need to know through the two days that you're here. So I would ask them to play the first video. Have you ever questioned why Congress does not reduce spending and balance the budget? The answer will shock you. They can't. Not even if they remove every department, employ, as well as the military. I'm Hal Mason, a retired accountant, and have worked with budgets over 40 years. This February, the White House released the United States budget. I was stunned to discover Congress can't balance the budget, even if they shut down the government. The dilemma facing Congress is startling. Watch as you see a budget that can't be balanced. To understand Washington's budget dilemma, we simply click on the President's Budget for Fiscal Year 2013. Page 210 provides 12 years of budget data. We will only look at this year, 2012. Washington will spend $3.8 trillion. However, it will only collect $2.5 trillion in taxes, resulting in a deficit of $1.3 trillion, an amount larger than what Congress appropriates to operate the federal government. Now to explain the dilemma. Government spending is broken down in three simple categories. Interest, mandatory programs, which is entitlements and government pensions, and the federal government, which is called discretionary programs. It breaks down the government in two pieces, security-related, which includes the military, and non-security, which encompasses any spending that is not related to the nation's security, such as Department of Education, Energy, etc. We simply cross out the federal government, and the remaining cost exceeds all tax revenues. The problem is simple. Spending for mandatory programs and interest is greater than the tax revenues collected. Mandatory programs include Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, unemployment, and federal pensions. Congress must pay the interest and has promised to pay the pensions and entitlements. So the dilemma they face is that after the checks are processed for mandatory programs and interest, there isn't one dollar left to fund the military or any federal employee department or office. You now understand their dilemma. To balance the budget, Congress would either have to raise taxes 50 percent or eliminate the federal government. If they cut entitlements and pensions, our nation will have riots like Greece. The United States only collects two and a half trillion in taxes. More than half comes from income taxes, 
a third from payroll taxes, and the remaining from excise, estate, duties, and some miscellaneous taxes. These aren't quite enough to even pay for the interest or the mandatory programs. Selecting Historical Table 7.1 reveals a grave problem. Spiraling debt that exceeds 100% of the gross domestic product. A liability that exceeds our nation's annual economy. And as I chart the debt, it reveals Washington's uncontrollable addiction to borrowing. The budget projects this year over 16 trillion debt and 26 trillion this decade. Soaring debt that has the United States on a path identical to Greece. And if you thought Greece was a problem, the United States has 32 times their debt. 16 trillion is 25 percent of the world's gross domestic product. As Washington is racing toward the cliff, there is no hint of slowing down. And for the first time in our history, the United States has lost its AAA rating on its treasury debt. Greece provides a preview of what happens when a nation is forced to deal with massive debt. Greece recently was downgraded to the lowest rating on the scale. Investors lost 70 percent in the recent European bailout, and the bailout of bonds are now rated as junk bonds. The question is not if, but when the United States will collapse from the weight of the soaring debt. And we need to ask, what are we paying these Washington intellects to do? They have no approved budget, they borrow every dollar to operate, and they estimate debt will soar to 26 trillion. Instead of solving the crisis, they raise the debt ceiling. There is a tipping point where the debt can no longer be sustained. So our nation can either get involved or be buried in the ashes. So you ask what can be done to correct this crisis? The answer is painful. First, Washington must admit the problem. Second, it must explain the problem to everyone. And third, we must face the pain of fixing the problem. It won't be solved by arguing over who pays the highest fares on the sinking Titanic. Everyone is going to feel the pain, as the United States must cut into entitlements, pensions, government spending, as well as get a fair tax code that doesn't cripple the economy. Everyone must vote for representatives who will focus on the financial solvency of the United States. If not, we will all go down with the ship. I obviously speak as an American. I know there'll be a few in here. We no longer raise our hands to admit we are, so I'm not going to ask you that you are. Uh, it is not pleasurable. It is certainly not profitable. I don't sell log cabins. I don't sell dry food or ammo. So I'm not enjoying predicting turmoil and uh, terrible problems for America. But there's no way out. Uh, America has been robbing Peter to pay Paul. People know I've said this since the fall of 2007. Uh, Europe is the, is the only opening act. What we're seeing in Europe uh, is coming to the shores of America. I don't know the date and time or the extent, but I know it's coming. And there'll be a great debate shortly uh, among Republicans and Democrats, and each will argue about whose fault this really is. There'll also be a general debate about class warfare, and that is happening too. But there's another factor that very little is spoken about. And if you learn anything today from my talk, I hope you'd appreciate it. And the gentleman, again, I'm going to show you another video in a moment. Put together and describe that problem. And after you watch this video, I'll tell you why I agree fully with him. So if you please, can you play the second video? This is Blazing Goli again for another installment of Government Gone Wild. You know, we keep on hearing that if we want to get Congress back on track to representing us, that we need to get the special interests out of politics. And I wholeheartedly agree. But what most fail to realize is that government itself is its own special interest and will do and or say almost anything to protect itself. Now stay tuned because at the end of this video I'm going to show you why our freedoms may be at stake if we don't cut government soon. Our federal government has seen an explosion in its size over the last 10 years and both political parties are to blame for this. 
How big has it grown? Over the last decade, the number of private sector employees has grown only 1%. But the number of federal government employees has grown 15%. We are now out of the era of big government and into the era of enormous government. Basically, Congress used this recession to expand government and entrench government workers. When this recession started, while you are worrying about paying the bills and keeping a roof over your family's head, the Transportation Department had one. Just one employee making over $170,000 a year. Today, that number is 1,690 employees. When this recession started, while you are worrying about keeping your job and putting food on your table, the Department of Defense had 1,868 employees making over $150,000 a year. Today, that number is 10,100 employees. In fact, when this recession started, the number of federal employees making more than $100,000 a year doubled in less than two years. And when you include salary and benefits, the average total compensation for a private sector employee in 2009 was $61,000. Now, take a guess what the average total compensation for a federal government employee was in 2009. A whopping $123,000, more than double that in the private sector. Do you really think these people will vote against any spending cuts? Now, this is the important part. There are approximately 21,300,000 government employees in this country. We'll talk about special interests. About 16% of this nation's voting electorate works for government. And most people have at least one person close to them, like a spouse, who will vote with them in an effort to keep their job. Well, that means at least 32% of the voting elector will come out and vote against anyone who talks openly about spending cuts. And when that number hits 50%, well, it's game over, folks. And then we, the people, will be in the permanent minority. And therein lies the hidden danger of big government. Now, the only way we can make a difference is if people hear this message. Please, forward this video to everyone you know before we wake up one day and it's too late. Well, that's it for this edition of Government Gone Wild. Be sure to visit our website and sign up for our email updates and become a fan on Facebook and suggest it to all of your friends. Now, as I, as I said, as I said, uh, this is the next hidden problem. Uh, it won't be a matter of Republicans or Democrats not wanting to do things, but it will be the people themselves. And if you don't believe that, and you're Canadians and you're not following American politics, go home tonight and Google Wisconsin and watch what's happening in Wisconsin. A governor who stepped in who wanted to cut government is facing a recall vote. Unions and others who would be impacted greatly have gone and tried to recall the governor. And that is a test to what America faces. So with all these things in mind, it has been very difficult for me to have a bullish uh, factor on things. Now at my workshop, which unfortunately is tomorrow, not today, I'll go into greater detail and also discuss individual issues. But in the 15 minutes I have left, I'll try to paint a an overall view of where I believe things stand. In terms of the U.S. stock market, which I focus mostly on, in the fall of 2007, I issued what would be the most dire forecast I ever made and actually recommended only for the second time in 25 years for people to short the market. In March of 2009, I briefly entered the bullish camp and said we would have the greatest bear market rally. And in recent times, I've called that we are in a yellow alert my suggestion to people is this. I can't give you investment advice. That's not my job, nor am I registered to do so. But I can tell you what my thinking is. My thinking has been, and for the readers of the blog know, that I want to be a seller since that yellow alert, and by no later than the spring of next year, be completely or nearly completely out of equities, which may or may not include mining shares as well. That is not the case at the moment. But as I've noted in my writings, it may be, and of course I would tell my readers if and when that comes. In terms of the U.S. bond market, I've called it the worst investment for the next decade. 
And that may be hard for people to imagine when the bond, the 10-year bond, just set a record low at 1.44% on Friday. But keep in mind, and readers again can suggest and tell their neighbor next to them who doesn't know or read my blog, that I've been waiting and sometimes seeing from readers that some were impatient, but I've been waiting for what's occurring now to get into a short position. Because you see, if I am correct about America being the next Greece, that what happened in Greece and Spain and Italy, despite slowing economies, interest rates went through the roof, is what I also suspect will happen in America. And I find it impossible, in fact, if someone grabbed my most precious uh, possession, my daughter, and said you can only get her back in 10 years, what would be the worst possible investment one can make? And if I avoid it, you can have your child back. It would be the 10-year bond. Simply because at 1.44% over the next 10 years, I already know in my heart of hearts that inflation is going to be much higher than that. So that's a losing investment. However, I am preparing to, and may even tonight, alert my readers to actually finally go short the bond. But uh, that's something I'll know in the coming days. The U.S. dollar, something I've not been right on in recent times, uh, is the lesser of two evils. It is not slightly rising from its all-time lows because it's being yearned to be owned, but it's really rising simply because the euro is under more pressure than the dollar is at the moment. Uh, I think that will change when the shift comes from Europe to the U.S., which I think will be this summer. I think the crisis in Europe, as bad as it is, the worst is just in front of us now. And then the world will start to focus on America. So I'm actually looking for a further rally in the dollar to get short myself. Now precious metals. Now there's some wonderful speakers here. They really are. Some people that I listen to and take value in their issues. But there are also what I call the perma bears and perma bulls, people forever bullish or ever bearish. And apparently, I get a lot of questions, and so I want to preempt them by speaking about it for a moment, about one perma bear that I seem to attract attention from. I don't like to call people names, and people say when I do that I'm being unchristian. But this is the biggest nincompoop I've ever met in 30 years in the financial arena. And as long as that nincompoop is on one side of the trade, I am going to be on the other. Again, I want to suggest to people that we are in the mother of all gold bull markets. I, I don't know if I could, anybody could be more bullish than me. Uh, I know there's some as equal to that. I know Gatter, which a lot of people like to make fun of and call tinfoil hat wearers and all that other crap, but meanwhile they've been right where other people have been wrong. But people have not grasped what has changed in the gold bull market. And that's the reason why uh, so many bears remain out there. They have not grasped three critical changes that took place in the last decade. And they live as if the gold market was trading in the 90s. In the last 10 years, central banks, who were once the biggest net sellers of gold, have actually become net buyers. It started with the Washington Accord in 1999. And in the last two years, despite the ability to sell up to 500 tons a year, they've actually been net buyers. So what was used to be a big negative and depressed prices no longer exists. We also had producers cutting their nose to spite their face by hedging and selling great quantities of their future gold production forward. In fact, the old Barrick Gold, the American Barrick, was more of a commodities trainer than a gold producer. They used the derivative market to sometimes earn $100 more than any other company selling gold forward. Well, now selling forward is a dirty four-letter word to any CEO of a gold producer. So we don't see that pressure anymore. And then the last missing ingredient that forever changed the market until further notice was the creations of exchange-traded funds. Now, there's a great debate within the gold community. Some people argue against owning gold ETFs because they believe you can't take possession. It's not really ownership of gold and all. And I'm not here to debate that. But I am here to tell you as a former fund manager who felt it was very encumbrancing and kind of hard to own gold in the 80s and 90s because the only choice was physical bullion or mining shares, which ended up not being a real proxy for gold because they went down even when gold went up. The creation of gold ETFs created an ability, particularly for institutional investors, to purchase gold that would have never purchased gold before. And that's been the great change. And by not recognizing this, and simply for the fact that most people in the financial arena and the media that reports on them hate gold, 
but you got to understand and appreciate why they hate gold. Because if gold's going to rally a lot, financial assets aren't doing well. And since the financial arena and the media that reports on it makes a living off of financial assets, you're not going to root for something that actually goes against you. So you're never going to get public support to be a gold bug, or if that's what they like to call whatever anybody that's bullish. But I believe we are, and still am, in the early stage of a gold bull market. Now, when people hear about gold, particularly in this community, we will talk about junior resource stocks. And in junior resource stocks, I've been absolutely horrible. I probably in the last six months lost more money in paper than I ever imagined 20 years ago I would have. So I'm probably not the person to listen to. However, I would say this, you would have to believe that there would be no need further for metals and energies to the degree that the world is still known to be growing at to bet against the junior resource market. I've heard in recent weeks many say that 80% of the gold exploration companies will disappear. Well, one thing I've learned in this business, they don't really disappear, they get born again. They uh, recapitalize, they change the name, they even change the properties, but somehow the same people are around. But I, I, I think it's a big mistake to think that somehow 80% of the industry won't exist a year or two from now simply because of the terrible bear market that we've incurred. They've always come back before, and I don't see any reason why they wouldn't. However, as I will note again at my workshop, this is a business where failure is the norm. As good intentions as everybody out there, including clients of my own, probably eight or nine out of 10 will not exceed their ultimate goals. So eight or nine or 10 out of my own clients, within a year or two, you'll come to me and go, what happened to XYC resources? You said blah, 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 blah. This business's failure is the norm. And what I find most difficult, almost 30 years in this business, and I repeat it over and over again, it's on the front of my blog, I say it at every chance I have a chance to speak to people is, you not only have to have the financial makeup to take the risk of losing part of all your capital, but the mental tolerance. And most junior resource players, including 80% of you, whether you want to admit it or not, do not have the mental makeup. I know that because I can tell by the death threats that you send me in the emails that you don't. So when you do go out there, and you're thinking of killing me and others that might have mentioned the junior resource stock that you're down 80% on, remember, failure is the norm in that business. Finally, the last market that I spend some focus on is the oil and natural gas market. Uh, I've been uh, a bear of late and feel that there's just no reason yet to run into natural gas. There's just so much of it and there's, uh, there's far more authorities to speak to you about it at this show than I, except that I believe we have an abundant supply. I really wish somehow in North America, both America and, Ca and Canadians, and I think it's more Americans' faults, if we would just recognize and give up our Lexuses and big cars and realize we could all get around on natural gas cars that can get us from one point to other, no offense, we really wouldn't worry too much about the Middle East because there isn't that big demand for sand. Because if we didn't need oil, uh, I'm sorry, there wouldn't be as big concern on what's happening in the Middle East. Someday, please God, uh, politics and politicians will come together and realize the, not only the abundance of natural gas that's available in North America, but how things can change socially, economically, and politically if we ever embrace it and get really behind it. I have six minutes left. Uh, I wasn't going to take questions, but I do know that my workshop is tomorrow, and I know many of you come here on Sunday, but don't come back Monday. So I, what I will do right now is for the next four or five minutes, take questions if there are any. Yes, sir. What was the last one? Molly Corp. I don't really follow Molly Corp, so I'll have to pass on that. The other question is gold dividends. One of the interesting things that's happened in the mining shares now uh, is how low the price earnings ratios have come. When I first started in the business, uh, it was very common for the typical gold producer to sell between a 30 and a 50 price earnings ratio. Most recently, Barrick Gold, which is kind of my bellwether for producers, got to a 9 PE. We've also seen some of them with their dividend yields of 2, 3, 4 percent. Obviously, Friday there was a big rally in them, but overall, I think the gold producers are very, very cheap. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's very costly for them. There's a great labor shortage now. Uh, you'll see in many of the big companies, everybody either has gray hair or bald hair. 
It hasn't been an industry of a lot of the youth have gone into, so there are critical labor shortages. It's become very difficult to operate in the mining business. Years ago, when I was a young man, and I see Rick Rule, and he had a little bit more hair at that time, uh, there were about only five or six places we would name in the world where we would maybe not put our head down and sleep pretty good because there may be some unrest. Now there's only about five or six places where we do put our head down and feel we can still wake up and not hear some social, economic, or environmental or political thing that's probably uh, facing us. But overall, I, I think the producers, particularly the ones that are paying good dividends, uh, like I said, I, I, I just don't see this, I don't see we're even remotely close to the end of the bull market. Now, I don't look for, nor do I wish, five or $10,000 gold. Because if we have five or $10,000 gold, the world as we know it and the world that I would like to live in and leave for my children and hopefully my grandchildren will not be a very good place. But I do think it's feasible for gold to get to an all-time real high, not a nominal high, but adjusted for inflation high. And right now that's between 23 and 2,500. I don't like targets. I don't like being a target. I feel standing up here, there's a few people that want to shoot at me right now. But targets of 23 or 2,500 on gold, I think is reasonable. I can take a couple more questions. Yes, sir. Comment on Sunridge Gold. Comment on Sunridge Gold. I, I didn't want to comment on any of my clients here, but I'll just say briefly, it's one of my largest personals holding Sunridge Gold. Uh, one of the things that I like now about the junior resource market, and I'm sure there's more quality people who will share you their ideas here, is that we're seeing a lot of juniors selling for even less of their cash holdings. In Sunridge uh, particular, it's actually selling its market cap is less, far less than its net asset value. And I think anytime you can look at a company like that. I also think the Chinese are going to get more and more involved in Eritrea, and I'm hopeful that it, that will show up in Sunridge one day. Yes, sir. Sure, good question. The question was, I mentioned earlier about being out of equities, possibly including uh, mining shares by 2013, and will that depend maybe on the gold price? Yeah, the gold price will be important at that point in time. It will also be important on who wins the election, because, and let me close on this, even though I have three minutes, I'll make this the last response. Uh, my view is the only person that had a chance to fix things is not going to be nominated, and that's Ron Paul. But let me tell you why I brought Ron Paul. If America doesn't fix its fiscal problem, it won't matter where it stands socially on other issues. So whether he believes in armies or not didn't really matter. If we don't fisk our fiscal house, everything else won't matter. I don't believe either party and who they currently have to run them to be president has the ability to fix the fiscal problem. But I do think a Romney win over Obama win may forestall the inevitable, where an Obama win will actually accelerate the inevitable. So if you ask me right now, would I have a shorter time frame about things going bad, it would be on an Obama re-election versus a Romney win. I think we could see with a Romney win, particularly if the Republicans hold the Congress or God forbid even take control of the Senate, there may be some enthusiasm that they can put some of the austerity programs that we need to go through through, but I don't think that's possible based on the videos that I just shown you. Uh, my time is coming to an end here. Uh, on Monday night, uh, we will uh, celebrate uh, the passing of who I believe is one of the best newsletter writers in our business, better than I was, uh, David Coffin. I would hope that I would see some of you there. If you don't have plans, I would ask you to come to the dinner. I would hope it would be both a celebration and also for those that have a deep heart, uh, he was one of the most enjoyable people that I enjoyed being an MC to and listened to. His brother Eric, who I always used to joke, was not the better looking of the two, will still be going. I strongly, strongly recommend that you uh, listen to Eric and the Hard Rock Analyst. Uh, David will always be in my memory as one of the more honorable and straightforward shooters, and I believe Eric will continue that tradition for the Hard Rock uh, Analyst. Thank you very much, and God bless.